This is one of the important life lessons. Don't mix up your pages before you come out. My name is David Elwood, and I want to welcome all of you to this very important uh, and I hope very productive discussion tonight. Uh, I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School, and the title of tonight's talk is Challenges to Democracy, the Future of Policing. And our focus is very much going to be on solutions, about ideas, about looking to the future. Uh, here at the Kennedy School, we spend a lot of time trying to understand the nature of the problems and the life that we face. But ultimately, our goal is to work across boundaries and to think about ideas and solutions. And we, we have with us here tonight three truly exceptional people, each of whom has been engaged quite uh, actively and visibly in finding solutions to the kinds of crises and the loss of legitimacy that is so often felt. Uh, among uh, particularly the African American community, but other communities, and many of our major police departments. And of course, the tragic events with the uh, killing of Michael Brown and Eric Garner, uh, and so many others, uh, uh, has been a lightning rod for, for all of us, uh, and for many people, uh, very, very personal. I did want to highlight, this is just one of many activities, and those of you who are interested, I hope are aware that there's also a series of discussions next week called The Week That Shaped the Future of Policing, where uh, uh, folks in the, uh, uh, by the, Ken the Kennedy School and members of student government will bring together a group of people in a, ser in a series of evenings. Uh, and the hope is to put together uh, concrete recommendations to pass along to President Obama's commission uh, about policing the 21st century, co-chaired, by the way, by <coughs> one of our guests here. So I also want to thank the uh, Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy, um, the Ash Center for Democratic Governance, the Criminal Justice Program, uh, and certainly the Institute of Politics for all the work uh, to put this together. And I especially want to thank our guests, several of whom have flown long distances in order to be here. Um, and it isn't for the weather, I am sure. So I want to briefly introduce our, our guests, but mostly to focus, get right into the discussion. Uh, to my immediate left here is Mayor Anise Parker. Um, she was elected May, uh, Houston's 61st mayor in uh, 2010, one of only two women in the, in the, to hold the city's highest elected, official, uh, elected office, and one of the first, uh, uh, one of the very few openly gay mayors of large cities. Uh, she's also chair of the Criminal and Social Justice Committee at the U.S. Conference of Mayors. By all accounts, she's doing a remarkable job. Uh, Re-elected, what, three times now? Um, uh, two-year term, that's another tough thing for a mayor. Um, in 2010, she was named to the Time 100, among the, meaning the 100 most powerful people uh, in the world. Uh, she spent many years in the service to people of Houston, six years as city councilor, uh, six years as controller. Um, she's held the offices of controller, city councilor, and mayor, the first person to do that. Um, She's a member of President Obama's Task Force on Climate Preparedness, chairs the Conference of Mayors, uh, Criminal Ju Social Justice Committee, as I mentioned, uh, and a variety of other things. She's also, one of the most interesting features is she taught in the police academy for five years prior to becoming uh, mayor. So she's someone that really has crossed these boundaries over and over. And uh, just last December, just a few months ago, um, she was ranked as, as the top US mayor in a worldwide competition for the best mayors and in the top 10, number seven, I believe, uh, worldwide mayor uh, by the, uh, for the World Mayor Prize. So congratulations on that. Um, <laughs> next, we have uh, Commissioner Charles Ramsey, who was appointed uh, Philadelphia Police Commissioner in 2008. Uh, and he leads the fourth largest police department in the nation with 6,400 sworn and 800 civilian uh, members. He co-chairs the president's task force, President Obama's task force on 21st century policing. And he's really very much been in the forefront of innovative police to, uh, policing strategies, evidence-based initiatives, organizational accountability, an important word for tonight, uh, and neighborhood-based programs while leading organizational change in the departments. He's previously served as uh, in the DC, as DC uh, uh, commissioner as well. He currently serves as president of both the uh, Police Executive Research Forum and the major uh, cities police uh, chiefs association. He is the only law enforcement official professional to hold both these uh, positions simultaneously. He too has received numerous awards, among them the John M. <coughs> uh, Penrith Leadership Award from the FBI 
Major Cities Chief National Executive Institute, um, Leadership in Policing Award from the Police Executive Research Forum, and the Innovations in American Government uh, Award from the Ash Center here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Ramsey. Third, we have Professor Philip uh, Goff. He's a visiting scholar here at the Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy, uh, and he's on the faculty at UCLA. Uh, he's an expert in race, policing, and intersectional identity. In that capacity, he's been recruited uh, as a researcher and a consultant to police departments around the country, a role he plays enthusiastically. Indeed, he's done work with Houston, um, and I think you grew up in Philadelphia, is that right? So lots of connections. Uh, his research investigates the possibility that both contextual explanations pay, that contextual explanations play an uh, underexplored role in producing racial inequity, uh, but rather than focusing on racial attitudes that are internally individual, he often examines ways in which environmental factors can produce racially disparate outcomes. Um, quite strikingly, he's the co-founder with Captain Tracy uh, Cassie of the Center for Policing Equity, which is a research consortium that does promote transparency and accountability uh, by facilitating innovative research collaborations between police departments and scholars. So again, it's hard to imagine uh, a better group uh, for us to think this through. So I guess I'd actually like to uh, start in the middle here with Commissioner and ask you, um, uh, Commissioner Ramsey, uh, these horrible events that we've been seeing and the really uh, the highly visible loss of credibility um, uh, in some communities and police departments, maybe it's never been there, but how do you explain what we've been seeing? Um, how, uh, even as you've been part of the commission, so forth, what have you seen around the country? Uh, help us understand the basic problem here we're facing. Well, I think what you see <coughs> is the result of something that's been simmering beneath the surface for quite some time. Um, it, it really does boil down to the trust and legitimacy, which you mentioned earlier. And uh, certainly the uh, Ferguson incident um, the um, New York City, Cleveland, uh, as well as others, uh, really served as a spark to bring it to the surface. Uh, this is something, I've been in policing for um, a long time. I'm in my 47th year uh, in, in the business. So I've seen these kinds of things um, come and go, but this is a little different. Um, I've not seen the kind of widespread protests that we've had recently. Um, I've not really seen the level of um, concern and even anger on the part of people um, toward police directly, not toward some other event that may be going on, you know, like the Vietnam War, for one example, when I was a young rookie cop and we were kind of in the middle of it. But this is really directed at police. So I see this as a huge challenge, but also a tremendous opportunity for change in our profession. Um, you know, we've been engaged in community policing in general for the last 20 plus years, but clearly there are some communities that we have not reached. And, um, <clears throat> and we need to establish communication. We need to begin the process of, of building trust uh, because it's just not there in many of our communities, unfortunately. It's not everyone, but it's a significant number. And uh, we need to listen and hear what people are saying to us and make the changes necessary in order to gain the kind of respect, the kind of trust, the legitimacy that we need to have in order to be effective in building safe neighborhoods. And um, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but I'm excited about what's going on now because I think this is a great opportunity to have the kind of change that's really needed. How do you do that? How do you build trust? In the I think it starts with communication. It starts with building relationships. People at some point in time have to listen to one another. And I think that's really key. And um, you know, we need to, to take a real look at ourselves and some of the strategies that perhaps we've used. I, you know, when I hear people uh, talking about, for an example, uh, the broken windows and something that since 1982, when it was written, uh, more and more departments began to engage in the kind of activities that deal with lower level offenses, uh, believing that it's gonna you know, prevent larger um, offenses from occurring in the future. And there's some, um, uh, certainly in my opinion, <coughs> I believe that there's, um, you know, some, some evidence to show that that can in fact happen. But I think the problem for me 
is that whereas we had a strategy to go in and deal with these kinds of disorder type crimes that really destroy quality of life in a neighborhood, but we didn't have an effective strategy to deal with once the window was fixed. Once that broken window began to get repaired, you can't keep doing the same thing. And so our inflexibility, if you will, to start making adjustments, to start building community, start community building, so that people, if you want that window to stay repaired, then the community has to take ownership and they have to make the necessary adjustments in order to be able to maintain whatever gains were made. And we didn't do that across the board. Now when I say that, I'm not talking about policing across the board, maybe there are some agencies that did. We didn't, I mean, it didn't. I didn't start thinking about it until after this, this began. And it started, you know, what are we really doing? And do we still need to do the same kinds of things that we were doing before? Uh, how do we build that capacity within communities? How do we, you know, and during the course of ComStat, everybody wanted to be New York. Everybody wanted to have a 90% drop in homicides. And there was a lot of, you know, police chiefs and political leaders and so forth that wanted the same thing, fine. But we started concentrating more on the dots on the map and where it was occurring and what we needed to do than we did with the real human interaction and getting to know people. We kind of pulled away from some of the things that have been successful in community policing, building those relationships and working together to solve problems, we became very data driven. But you know, behind every icon on a map is a human being whose life's been changed because of crime and we can't lose sight of that. It's a neighborhood in peril. There's people who are out there suffering. We don't need to add to that. We need to have that human touch and I think we've, we've made some, um, we've stumbled along the way a bit and I think that that's kind of led to where we are today. But it's fixable stuff. Um, Professor Goff, you've been working with police departments, you've been on this issue long before the events, indeed, you came here to be on leave and uh, it's been instead a very um, very potent and productive time, but I'm sure very demanding. How do you see these sorts of issues and where do you look for solutions? Well, I think the commissioner's right that we're at a different space than we've ever been at when it comes to community policing, um, and particularly uh, communities of color, non-white communities. Um, but when I start thinking about how best to make sense of what it is that we've seen since August 9th of this summer. Um, I see it as you know, an, an organizational piece, there's a data piece. We've been doing evidence-based uh, reduction in crime for a long time, but we haven't been doing evidence-based approaches to social justice. Um, you've got a, a, the organizational piece is that it's very difficult for managers to hold individual officers accountable for their behavior if you don't have something you can measure. And so stops became something you can measure. The, the cops on dots became a thing that you could measure. But past that, how do you do something beyond arresting your way out of the problem? There have been a whole bunch of different things and I can put a scatter plot together for it. But when I think about what's at the core of it, I kind of end up getting biblical. So you'll forgive me. But when I think about what the problem was with Michael Brown's shooting death and the aftermath, and I think about the problem in the Eric Garner death and the aftermath, I don't think about the bullet through a head, and I don't think about a chokehold. I think about vision, and a crisis of vision. So forgive me, again, I'm a social scientist, I'll get into numbers later, but my, my thinking is, Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I'm not trying to get high and mighty, but I do want to explain. I love the passage not just because it's true, but because it ends up being a mistranslation of the Hebrew. It doesn't say perish, in the Hebrew it says para, which means to be shaken loose. Where there is no vision, the people are shaken loose. And how that relates back to what it is that I see when I go and talk to line officers and when I'm crunching data, is that we don't as a nation, beyond just a police set of police departments, we don't as a nation have a way to see, to make visible the humanity of the people that are living in these neighborhoods. And as a result, we don't have public policy that is responsive to that. So we see these things that look like images of when our parents' generations, or when our generations, if it's our kids, looking at it. <clears throat> but it's as if it's out of time, as if it's not a continuation. But if you walk in those neighborhoods and you talk to those folks, if you talk to the beat officers and the first line officers that have been there for quite some time, they'll say, we've seen this happening for a while. But nobody else has. So when we report back up, when we give you the numbers that become dots on a map, the full story of the humanity of the people that live in these neighborhoods hasn't been available to the police department or to the schools 
or to the employers, or to the housing authorities, the Better Business Bureau. And as a result, these things come as a shock to the system as if they're outside of our values. And so there's many things that we can do. We have an amazing opportunity because there's so much momentum behind this. And we do see this as counter to our values. But I think we would be doing ourselves a disservice if we don't go back and, and, and fix the kind of original sin of this, which is to me, we have not been positioned to see the humanity of the people that live in these neighborhoods for some time. And when I say we, I don't mean researchers, I don't mean law enforcement, I say mean we as a nation. The best thing we can do to move forward is to stop being surprised when we see it. Because no one in Ferguson was surprised. That, I think, is part of the point in sort of both the his historical stuff that I'm doing and the statistical stuff <coughs> that I'm doing. The stories of these neighborhoods is that they were not surprised. They were just surprised that everybody else was. Mayor, you, uh, you as you mentioned, uh, you, as I mentioned, you <coughs> taught in the police academy. You've seen, uh, you, you've been a mayor for a long time. You're a award-winning mayor. Um, how do you think about this, and how do you think about it in the context where, obviously, there's a whole lot of things that go on in, in, uh, in poor neighborhoods and other neighborhoods. How do you think about what's the problem, and, and you've been pretty aggressive and thoughtful in your solutions. Well, obviously, the solution starts before there's a crisis. And uh, Commissioner Ramsey mentioned community. I would say it, it's community, it's communication, and it's consistency. It, it, you can have an all-white police force patrolling and policing an all-black community, which is in essence what uh, um, Ferguson had, and you can do it successfully. But you can only do it successfully if those officers understand what's going on in the neighborhood, if they know who, who the influencers are, if, if they have relationships, if they've, if they've built their own networks. And now I think it's important to have a, a police force that looks like community, and the, and the city of Houston's been going in, in that way for a long time, but just looking like the community isn't where you need to be. You have to have that communication. And then there's another piece that's lacking, and that is that for most communities, they really don't have an understanding of what real policing's like. I mean, you know, we, we all have a steady diet of, of cop shows on TV, and, and uh, you know, in an hour, everything's solved, and, and it's, it's, it's all resolved. But I don't think, for most community members, they have a real understanding of the difficulties of policing. You have to understand that when a police officer encounters a citizen, it is almost always a negative interaction. Almost always. You may be really glad to see that officer, but you are in distress <coughs> of some kind. So that, that citizen is, is starting from a position of they're, they're unhappy in some way. And, and you take a, a, an inevitably negative interaction, and then you layer cultural misunderstandings, you, you, you layer on you know, history of, of, of problems on top of that, and you have a, a situation that's difficult to navigate through. So then it takes you to go from community to communication. Uh, and and I know we're not going to spend a whole lot of time, I think, talking about Ferguson, but I want to say that I have, I have seldom seen such a mishandled communication situation from a public policy standpoint, from, from public officials every one of whom I would give a failing grade to. But what many, many public officials have failed to realize is the change that social media has wrought and how bad misinformation, how, how quickly bad information or misinformation can travel through a community and get amplified while uh, police officials or mayors are still trying to figure out what actually has, has, has happened. And so we, we too quickly lose control of the, the mechanisms of communication. So then we fall back on that, that, that network. If you have people in the community that you can call, I mean, I expect my police chief in a crisis, he knows, depending on what happened and what, what community it is, he knows the five people he needs to get on the phone immediately to make sure that things 
calm down. The other thing that, in terms of communication, is that my community was justifiably angry. You have to allow people to express that anger. You have to allow an opportunity to, to, to vent, to, to let some of the air out of the balloon, release some of the pressure. And obviously we all know that, that the, the right to, to public protest and civil disobedience is ours. And yet, and, and I think most big city police departments are trained in appropriate methods of handling that. But again, a lot of smaller police departments, they've never had big public demonstrations. They've never had to experience it and they don't, they don't know. So there's a, there's a training element in there. And then when I said consistency, people have to know that there are clear policies, that those policies are enforced in every case, that there is transparency in the enforcement of those policies, whether that is discipline, whether that is training, whether that, ha that is how an incident is investigated, and that there is a, you, you, you build trust. You don't build trust in the crisis, you build, build trust over long periods of time working consistently with the community. So well, part of what I'm hearing all of you say, and certainly Mary, you, I mean, you kind of suspect the person, in, the chief in Ferguson didn't have five names to call. It wasn't that he didn't think to do it, they just, and, and so I don't know either. I don't know either one. We don't, we have no idea. But the, but the, the part of what I'm hearing you all say is, in some ways, we've either mischaracterized or lost our way sometimes on how to think about community policing. We kind of forgot the community part. Um, and that, uh, so some of it is, you know, some of it, there are things that clearly are failures that most big city police departments own. But we did have the institute in Staten Island. We have, you know, uh, the police turning their back on the mayor in New York City. I mean, we have remarkable incidents here. Um, and of course, we also, here in Boston, uh, just a couple of years ago, in this very place, uh, you know, we were sitting up and applauding for the extraordinary work that our police departments had done after the Boston bombing. And that combination is a, has got to be a huge challenge. And so I'm hearing the beginnings of almost a return to the idea that it's, it's more than policing. It's, it's, as you said, community building. Is that, I'm, I'm, I don't mean to put words in people's mouths, but it, can you be, give us a concrete example of what would, we might be different and as you think about your strategies, each of you? Well, I mean, the problem I have with this, not just this conversation, but what's been going on, is that it tends to, um, for lack of a better word, indict the entire profession and every city, and there's been no progress, and everyone lost sight of what's going on, and, and, and it's just, it's not true, but again, when you get these images over and over again, you got 24 hour news cycles, all you see is just repeats of the same thing over and over again. It certainly does give that impression. Now that's not to say that there aren't issues and there aren't, there aren't some concerns, because there are very, very serious concerns. But policing may not be in as bad a shape as people think, but I think the larger society needs to be paying attention to what's going on because it's more than just police. When you have some of the dissatisfaction, it's not just with police, it's with the system itself. It's frustration with an educational system that in many communities is just dysfunctional and not preparing people so that they can get jobs. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, frustration with people who, are, who have committed crime, gone to jail, come back out and would like to, to lead a different kind of life, can't find a job, can't vote, can't do any of the things that would help them regain full citizenship. And they get frustrated. And you know, you have to eat every day, not, every, not wait six months to eat for somebody to decide to give you a job at, at McDonald's, you know? It's, it's just, it, so what are you gonna do? You're gonna go back to what you can do in order to support yourself and your family. So it's a vicious cycle that at some point has to be broken. Dysfunctional families, substance abuse, uh, cops that uh, have not been, we don't take into account the, uh, the, the, the post-traumatic stress, not just with military, but with police officers who were exposed for years at a time with, with some of the dysfunction that goes on in many communities. Uh, and we catch people at their worst more often than not. 
and, and, and how do we take care of the police officers so they maintain balance? Um, it, it, it's, it's a complicated issue that <clears throat> in some regards is, you know, obviously it's at the forefront now and it is pretty bad, but it, in my opinion, we can, this is an opportunity for us to do something to correct it, but just correcting what's wrong in police is not gonna lead to any real long-term difference. It's not. And, and so until we, all of us, want to face some hard truths and make real change in our communities, in a way in which government operates, in a way in which police operate, everybody taking a look to see what can I do better than what I'm doing right now then we're going to be back here again in I don't know how long, but all we can do is take this thing from a boil back down to a simmer. And what we got to do is cool it off, totally. And so this is an opportunity to do that. We'll see whether or not that happens. And, and there's not a quick fix because right. I think a lot of folks say, oh, all we need is, you, if you put a body cam on every police officer out there and we will have hard video evidence if, no. I mean, that, that, there's a whole range of, of uh, legal issues around that evidence <coughs> as, as, as well, but that's not a solution. It's a tool, and we all want quick fixes for this. And, and you know, we all had two police officers dead in, in New York. We, you know, um, you were telling me a story about our cops hesitating too. Well, uh, listen, again, and, and this has affected everyone. Uh, the, the story that he's, he's referring to just before Thanksgiving. I had a, a couple of my officers working a wagon and they, they pulled up on a robbery in progress and as they were pulling up, the bad guy's coming out and he's armed, he fires at the car, hits the car a couple times. The officer gets out and he actually has a graze wound that goes, I mean he was just a fraction of an inch from it going right in his eye. Uh, and I saw him in the hospital and they were able to return fire and, and um, neutralize the threat. But when he's in the hospital, he's saying the first thing he thought was about the Ferguson situation. Now, that, I mean, he's, he's just very, very lucky. So it, it affects everybody in a different way. And, it, and I think it's time to just take a deep breath and start working toward fixing the problem because there is a problem. I'm not saying it's not, believe me. Uh, you know, I look around this audience and with one or two exceptions, you know, I'm one of the older folks uh, in the room here. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I am African American. And, and so it means I've been black longer than a lot of people in this room. <laughs> so I have experienced a lot of this same stuff myself as a kid growing up, okay? And maybe and everybody's got their own story and everybody's got their own thing and so forth. So it's not that I'm insensitive, but at the same time, it's a community that's got to rescue the community, not the police. And we got to look at some hard facts. If African Americans are 13% of the population, why are we 50% of the homicide victims? in the United States. Why is that? Why is it that we have this concentration of poverty that tends to always be right in communities of color? How come we can't get the, that every generation of immigrants that's come to this country has have been able to kind of lift themselves out of poverty, yet we seem to be stuck in neutral here, and can't seem to, as a group, uh, you know, uh, get out. So these are real social problems that have to be fixed we're a part of the solution, but we're not the only part of it. And until we really look at everything, then again, we're gonna be, it's gonna be like Groundhog Day. We're gonna be doing this over and over and over again, and it's not really gonna improve. That's yeah, right. When you, when you talk about community policing or return to community policing, I would absolutely say no. That's not what we're looking for. I don't think that would be, a st I don't really think that would be a step forward. In part because community policing used to be a return to Robert Peel's, the pe police are the public and the public are the police. But now it's not a noun, it's a verb. It's we, we community police, which is a thing, you've got a unit, you've got a, a box you can check, you've got a CYA. Okay? And so I don't think that, that a return through that is the way to go, but I do think community accountability is a thing that we can get to. Right? And so let me give you sort of an example of the way that might work. Um, <coughs> If you're getting federally subsidized grants as a police department, many police departments do, um, through you know, JAG, Burn uh, type grants, you're, you gotta be accountable for that. So you have to report back to the federal government what it is you're doing with the federal government's money. And there are guidelines for what's appropriate to be doing with the money. And one of the first lines on the guidelines is, by the way, if you have an increase in drug-related arrests, please let us know that. That doesn't mean Right, that absolutely the federal government is, in, is encouraging that. It's just one of the lists of things you might be able to do. But if you're under time pressure and you're understaffed, not like any police department in the country, 
um, <clears throat> then you might end up listing that as one of the things that you've got. And that might trickle down to your first line supervisors and your line officers. Now, if I'm going to go out and I'm going to do some drug arrests, right, I'm going to do that as part of what I'm being held accountable to do to keep my job and to be able to promote, I'm not going to go into the house where people are smoking weed. I'm not going to go into the dorm room where folks are doing a line. I'm going to do it where there are people doing it in an open-air market. Police didn't set up the communities such that open-air markets happen in white neighborhoods. Police did not set up government redlining. Police did not set up the way in which tax dollars go to schools. Police are tasked with doing a set of things that the community has decided and their representatives have decided is a good idea to do. So when we talk about the ways in which the, the drug trade and the war on drugs connects to disparities, we're not talking about a policing problem. We're talking about policing statistics. That's not the same thing. So if we want to hold law enforcement accountable for the disparities that we see through that, please, let's talk about the housing components to it. Let's talk about the historical accuracies of it. Let's make sure that the people who are voting understand what they're voting for and the consequences of it. Let's improve our literacy on these issues. So when, when we're talking about a, a return to community policing, only if the community knows what the police do, only if the community is racially literate and policing literate enough that they understand the consequences of their voting and policy actions. Because I, I think one of the most profound things in my experience as a researcher and sort of policy interventionist is when I heard for the first time a black police chief say, when the laws of this land were, late, were racist, whose job was it to enforce the law? That's not the police's fault that it was their job. That's the police's job that it was their job. So I want us to be more accountable for that as a, as a group of communities, as opposed to just putting it all on law enforcement. Here. And yet the police still have to go out every day mm -hmm. and do their job while all these problems continue <coughs> to, to fester. And so you have to have, it has to be on two tracks. You have to have, you have to have better tools and resources for police, police officers. You have to have better training for police officers in how to, to interact. I, when I was city controller, I did a performance review of our use of tasers. Every police officer in the city of Houston has a conductive electricity device, I think is what they're technically called, but brand name people are familiar with, with taser. And I looked at who across the department used them, how often they use them, and uh, there was, of course, an interesting bell curve as to officers when they use their, their tasers. But then when you started drilling down, it was the um, it, younger officers much more prone to using tasers. Why is that? Well, one, it's an electronic device. The younger officers are more familiar with it. But older officers, you know, they had, they had already established themselves in their careers before they got that piece of equipment. They had other tools and techniques for dealing with situations. Who used the tasers least? Female officers. And, I, and I, my opinion, and I didn't do the kind of research that Dr. Goff does, but is that a woman has already figured out that she's not going to muscle somebody to the ground. And she has figured out other strategies to, to de-escalate. Yeah. And so giving officers not just another tool on their literal tool belt, but more tools for how to deal with the range of mental health issues that we have across communities, not just, it's not just the, you know, the issues of, of, of poverty and, and, and race, more and more our officers are encountering people who are you know, out of control on, on you know, controlled substances, they have huge mental health issues, and if, you, if their first reaction is fear, it's going to be a bad encounter. You know, I, I really agree with what the uh, mayor is saying, you know, training, education of officers is critically important. We do a good job in a police academy of teaching the technical aspects of policing. You know, this kind of arrest that requires this kind of report, and this is the statute that you cite, and blah, blah, blah. But very little, if any, in understanding your role in a democratic society, uh, understanding, you know, concepts like procedural justice, legitimacy, why that matters, the history uh, that we have in policing in the United States so you can put it in some kind of context as to why some people don't trust and for generations have not trusted police. I mean, you need to understand these things. We need to change also our performance measures 
in policing. We want cops to go out and do all this stuff, but what do we do? At the end of the day, it's did crime go up, did crime go down? And the only category that counts is homicide. I can have the best year in the world in Philadelphia. If my homicide's up, believe me, and the, the Daily News and the Inquirer, that's, that's going to be uh, the story. It's not about how many relationships we develop with community, how many community meetings we've had, how many problems we've resolved. Our performance measures need to change. A friend of mine said something, and it was in the context of a lesson learned from all that's going on, and, we, and <clears throat> it made perfect sense because we look at success in policing in terms of crime reduction or the absence of crime, and he said success isn't the absence of crime, it's in the presence of justice in a community. Think about that. That's what's going on. Crime rates are at the lowest level in decades, and people are upset. Why? Because th they don't feel the presence of justice in these communities. We gotta fix that. We've gotta fix it. And we don't fix it through traditional policing methods. That's the problem, and that's the challenge. Terrific. So there are microphones uh, for people to come from the audience and ask questions of our panel. There's one right here, there's another one up here, a third one there, and a fourth one there. So please line up, and I suggest if you're, there's a long line in one, go to one of the others, because I'll just go around the loop here. So let me start here. Let me just describe what makes for a good question here. Uh, the, f the first thing is you identify yourself, the second is you keep it short, and the third is you end it with a question mark. So please go forward. Thank you so much. My name is Dwayne Pender. I'm a joint degree candidate at the Kennedy School and the Business School. I uh, really appreciate uh, all of you coming here and making time. I think the question I have is, uh, you talked a lot about different strategies and tactics uh, given uh, what's happened. I think the question I have is, in light of, uh, I think the mayor, you said, if the first reaction is fear. I think first reactions a lot of times are based on implicit associations. Um, and if someone looks at me, uh, the first reaction could be fear, even though I'm wearing a, a Harvard jointy Patagonia and I have a Harvard hat on versus uh, someone else who doesn't look like me. And so I'm interested in everybody's perspectives on what is going to be done if you have an all-white police force, if they look at a young African-American male or anybody else, if they're uh, based on those implicit associations. Philip, you studied this explicitly. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> about implicit associations, uh, they're really hard to change. Um, they come about because, not because people are bad, but because people are paying attention to the culture. For those who are not familiar with the phrase implicit association, is the automatic associations that you've got in your head. And if you believe that you don't have associations between groups and stereotypes, I've got a test that you can take. Um, <clears throat> everybody's got them. They're a part of a, a normal and universal human psychology. There are trainings that you can do to separate, not to reduce the bias, but to separate the bias from the behavior. Right? And I like to quote Jay Smooth, I call him a prophet, but he hosts a, a radio show in, in uh, New York, who says that if somebody steals my wallet, I don't chase them down to find out whether or not they feel like a thief in their heart. I chase them down to get my wallet back. And that's what we have to do with the, the consequences of implicit bias, is hold people accountable for their behavior. One caveat on that, any kind of attitude, and implicit bias is a kind of attitude, any kind of attitude is 10% of behavior at best. Your prejudices, if you say, I don't like that group of people, I don't like Catholics, I don't like black people, I don't like Latinos, I don't like police officers, that's 10% of behavior at best. What do I mean by, I see a lot of furrowed brows, what do I mean by that? Anybody in here know anybody who they think of as a liar? Anybody? Couple folks, yeah? <laughs> do they lie all the time? Now, a couple people saying yes, but you're married to them, so that doesn't count. <laughs> <clears throat> they don't lie all the time, because if they did, we would call them opposite truth tellers, and they'd be the most reliable people we'd ever met. Okay? They lie when they're motivated to, they think they can get away with it, or when the consequences are small. You know who else lies when they're motivated to, they think they can get away with it and the consequences are small? Everybody. Situations produce behavior, not character. So I appreciate the question, it's really important. We gotta get trainings in that. But more than the trainings, we have to create policies that insulate people from the situations where their biases are in control as opposed to the Constitution and the law. And the other part of that, I think, you know, when the, the doctor talks about uh, training, self-awareness has got to become now part of regular police training because you may not even be aware of some of the biases that you have. Now, how do you manage that? How do you not let that 
trickle over into what you do on a regular basis so you can take steps to guard against it and make sure that what you're doing is engaging in real fair and impartial policing as opposed to being driven by other things. And, and I think that's impo important. We don't, when I say we, some departments no doubt probably do. The ones that I've been in, and we're in a, in a, in a, in a process now of totally revamping our training, that is part of what we're looking at and we're installing and we're instituting within our training. Right over here. Thank you, Dean Edelwood. Um, my name is Michael McNally. I'm a second year grad school at the Kennedy School. Uh, uh, sorry, grad student. Um, I'm also from Houston, Texas. Mayor Parker, it's good to see you. Uh, I appreciate the comments about um, community development and relationship building. I'm wondering for a law enforcement agency where those resources are gonna come from if you know, community development is not related to enforcing the law. Well, let me uh, take a stab at that. We, we can't, we don't have anything in our budget to, to do it. That's why it's gotta be much broader than just police. It's gotta be buy-in at a lot of different levels to fix the problem. Can we be a big part of it in terms of getting it off the ground? Absolutely, we have a role to play. Can we totally support and sustain it? No, we can't. So it, it does take a lot of people sitting down and coming up with a real vision, a real strategy, with the dollars behind it to invest where it needs to be invested if we wanna have some kind of long-term or even short-term impact for that matter. It goes back to the point I made earlier. This isn't just about policing and just about police because if we look at it that way, and whatever recommendations our task force comes up with, okay, fine, these are things that we believe will be necessary in policing. Will it fix the, really, really fix what's wrong? No, it won't. It'll be a move in that direction, but it won't totally take care of many of the issues that we're confronted with. Thank you. I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. Hi, my name is George Carandinos. I'm a medical student here at Harvard and also an anthropology grad student. I grew up in Houston and I lived in Philadelphia and worked as an anthropologist there for six years. <laughs> um, and <laughs> my question is for Commissioner Ramsey. Um, and I, I wanted to ask, over the years as a reform-minded commissioner, you've publicly expressed your frustration with the disciplinary processes in Philadelphia. Yes and specifically with a pushback from the local police union. For example, in 2008, within four months of taking office, you had to deal with a national incident of uh, police beating that was caught right. on camera. You fired several officers, they were reinstated subsequently. Also more recently, in 2012, <coughs> um, your decision to fire an officer who was caught on camera clearly assaulting an innocent woman during the Puerto Rican Day Parade was also overturned. Following that more recent decision, Mayor Nutter, District Attorney Williams, joined you in expressing deep frustration with this outcome. And sure. so, somebody who's worked in yeah. was that question? We'd yeah. Like so, as somebody who's worked in multiple cities at the highest level of the police department, I was wondering if you could address two questions, um, specifically from your experience in Philadelphia. One being, what are the institutional and local cultural challenges to reform that you face personally, and that have been unique to Philadelphia? And how can we externally promote discipline in a police force like Philadelphia's? when the police union is so effective in defeating disciplinary measures and protecting well, uh, malfeasant police officers? <laughs> nice, easy questions. Well, well, let me talk about discipline in a broader context, okay? Part of the mixed messages that we send our officers, we want them to go out and we want them to engage in you know, procedural justice. We want them to do X, Y, Z with the community. And yet internally, there is none. We are so punitive, the only thing we can think to do with somebody who does something wrong is suspend them or fire them. That's it. So if the goal is to really change behavior, what are options beyond that? And have internal procedural justice so that officers feel like they're getting a fair shake, which is gonna change their attitude and their behavior and make them more inclined to do the same out there on the street. So. Is the arbitration system an issue? Yeah, I mean, there, there's no question about that, okay? But I'm not gonna pretend as if I'm gonna fix that, all right? The bottom line is we've gotta think of a different way of approaching discipline and behavioral issues within our department. You know who really fixes problems within the police department ultimately in terms of discipline? It's not policy and procedure and all the punishment I can come up with. It's when we have a culture in policing where other cops stand up and say, we don't do that here. Mm -hmm. If we want community members to stand up and say, we don't tolerate this kind of stuff in our neighborhood, then we have to have the same attitude inside of police departments if we really wanna stop misconduct. That's the only way you're gonna make 
real progress in terms of changing the dynamic of, of things um, as it relates to how officers behave. My police chief would say exactly the same thing about the arbitration process, but do you know who, who brings most complaints against police officers in the Houston Police Department? Other police officers, and yeah, that's what you want. Right over here. Uh, thank you. My name is Ken Williams. Uh, I'm a retired homicide detective. Uh, one of the things that I did uh, for a PD that I worked with here in Massachusetts, I ended up having to uh, file what's called a False Claim Act lawsuit against them, a civil litigation um, regarding the grants that they received over the past uh, 10 years under the False Claim Act. Um, the doctor raised an interesting point, which is that when police agencies take federal uh, money, they have to comport with anti-discrimination law. And once they have to uh, comport with federal anti-discrimination law, the things that the people in the streets are complaining <coughs> about is how do they hold the people that are tax, you know, they're, they're paid for by taxpayer money. How do they hold them accountable? And for reform and justice and for accountability under the False Claim Act, when we're talking about in the past, uh, since 1995, $15 billion being expended in the COPS grant program for hiring, for the militarization of police officers, the training mechanism has always been there. The problem is the accountability mechanism. It's been lacking. So under the False Claim Act case, and I, I suggest everyone look it up, it's United States Ken Williams versus the city of Brockton, if you have a chance. Um, we're now proceeding in federal court, and under this mechanism, it could become a class action lawsuit for all those police officers that are within the agencies that want to become whistleblowers, that have information that can resolve some of these longstanding disputes and conflicts between citizens and police, uh, because we have some people, unfortunately, that are abusing their authority. Ultimately, that's what it comes down to. Every agency, every business in the face of this earth has a certain percentage of people that yeah. will abuse their authority. So my question is this. Good. Yes, yes. <laughs> my question is this. Um, going over the CBAs, the MOAs, and the contracts, and the policies, and the policies, and, and the practices, what would you say is, you know, in terms of the internal mechanism for police officers to come forward, they often become retaliated, retaliated against for their actions, for coming forward. What are you doing to provide safety to those officers that do come forward? Is that for, that, uh, take for, it, for the panel? Anybody. Every department has to have internal processes to prevent that. It, it starts at the highest levels of the department. It starts with the, the uh, the, the training and oversight of your internal affairs uh, division. You have to have the political leadership that uh, uh, supports that kind of, of a culture. I mean, I don't know how any of us could answer any other way. Yeah, and until you get a critical mass of officers that really engage in that kind of um, behavior where they will, they're not afraid to turn someone in. Houston's a good example. Mm -hmm then that starts to correct that. If you don't have critical mass, then it's just like asking one of your witnesses in that homicide who lives in a very troubled neighborhood to come forward and stand up and say that so-and-so is the one that did the shooting. But if the whole neighborhood stands up and says so-and-so did the shooting, it's a whole different dynamic at work. So you have to create that environment where you get that critical mass. The only, the only thing I would add to that, uh, the, the chiefs, superintendents, commissioners, and sheriffs that have been successful have demoted and shuffled their command staff to reflect their values right. and to push those values downstream. So I mean, critical mass is, is, is the key, but if the command staff is saying to other command staff and in front of rank and file officers and in the homicide unit and in IA, that's not how we do things, and the people who speak out get promoted, you'll see people change rather rapidly. If you change the incentive structure, you'll see the culture change. But there, in the academy, in any organization, any business, we don't have a way to protect whistleblowers that's more profound and more secure than changing the culture of the organization. And that's a long-standing thing to be able to do. Thank you. Uh, the folks up top oh, there. didn't see you up there. So Wait. why don't I go up there? Sorry. Uh, my name is Erin Bowman, and I work at the Slate Initiative here at the Kennedy School. Um, before moving back to the U.S., I lived in Ireland for seven years and spent a significant portion of time in Belfast in Northern Ireland. 
And in the late 1990s and early 2000s, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, now the Police Service of Northern Ireland, underwent a massive reformation. And one of the biggest reforms that they actually made, one of the ones that was pushed most heavily by the community, was on pacification methods. And in particular, the move away from the use of threat and armed force through rubber bullets and water cannons towards actual pacification using kind of non-active phalanxings protected by shields. So I guess my question is, is it possible in your mind to think of reforming police pacification methods in the US away from the use of threat and the use of force and towards something that would be based upon more pure pacification methods? And if it is, how can that be done? Well, I don't know if I can, if I'm gonna answer this um, directly or not, but there is a lot now, and the mayor had mentioned it earlier about de-escalation and knowing that your action will, will cause a reaction. If you're on a front line of a demonstration, for example, and if uh, all the officers got their helmets on and riot gear, guess what you're gonna get, a riot. And if you're out there dressed differently and if you don't have the heavy equipment and all that sort of thing, then guess what you're gonna probably get, a peaceful demonstration. So, I mean, we've learned that. And I mean, I've been to Belfast, uh, Duncan McCausland, who was the head of uh, the police there, and I are very good friends, and he often talked about how at one point during the Troubles, uh, in order to respond to a call, they really had to bring the military with them to respond to a call. In those same neighborhoods now, cops are riding mount mountain bikes and interacting with the community. So if it could happen there, then there's no reason why it can't happen here, and I think that most departments don't think that what you saw in Ferguson is a reflection of police departments across the country because most chiefs, and at least the ones that I know, looked at that and kind of said, whoa, wait, you know, what's going on here? When they saw the initial reaction and deployment of people, uh, of officers rather, during the initial uh, demonstrations. That is not something that would have happened in most, uh, certainly major cities. I don't know about some of the smaller ones, but certainly major. Uh, so yeah, the answer to your question hopefully is, uh, yeah, we gotta constantly reinforce that. I, was, I would throw something else in though, that America is awash in guns. And there are, and unlike most of Europe, you are going to have, there, that, that's just a fact. There are more guns in America and you never want, you want your officers to understand <coughs> the, the context, you want your officers to have de-escalation techniques, but you never want your officers to hes hesitate at the risk of their own lives. Period, end of sentence. And so it, it, that's, a, that's a difference from some of those other places. Okay, I just wanted to mention that uh, the commissioner needs to catch an airplane to return to Philadelphia. He needs to quit at seven and it's- uh, I can go about 10 after if you want. Okay, we'll go a couple of minutes over, but- As I long as I have a ride. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll find a good way to get you to the airport. There we go. Good evening, my name is Corey Tolbert. I manage uh, security at the Harvard Business School. Uh, we've talked a lot about accountability from an internal standpoint, but we haven't talked a lot about accountability from the criminal justice standpoint. A big part of why people were so angry about what took place in Ferguson was not only, uh, you know, that the death happened in the first place, but that the, the grand jury process failed that community and, and failed um, the country in a lot of people's minds. So my question is, do we feel like the, the burden um, for police officer misconduct as it sort of morphs into potentially criminal action is too high or so high that we're leading to police officers who are, you know, outside of their training, uh, killing people, and they have no, there's no recourse within the criminal justice system. Is I, that burden too high? I, I, don't, I, I don't believe that's true. I, I, don't, I don't believe that's the case. I mean, certainly these cases get highlighted, but when you look at the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of contacts and arrests that are made across this country by police uh, that don't result in any kind of significant use of force or certainly use of deadly force, then you have to rethink that because it's just not, it, 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 it's not, it's not accurate. Now, having said that, all it takes is one to really cause a problem. Uh, we have a unique responsibility and duty within society and of enormous power that an authority that we've been given, uh, which just as an aside, <clears throat> I'll mention it now because I'm over 60 and I tend to forget stuff real quick. But one of the other things that we don't do in policing is teach officers how to deal with power and authority that they've been given. You get some 19, 20 year old kid and you bring him in the academy, you give him a badge, give him a gun and a 
Crown Vic can go 200 miles an hour and then you wonder why you have issues <laughs> if, you, if you don't take time to really help them better understand their role and all the things that go along with it. But I think that what this calls for is a commission to look at the entire system from start to finish, including all those things that uh, Dr. Goff mentioned about educational systems, about social services, all these kinds of things. The last presidential commission that looked at the entire criminal justice system was in 1965 under President Lyndon Johnson. Most of you in this room may have read his name in a history book because you were not alive when that was done. It's time. It's time we take a look at crime in America, the future of policing and criminal justice in America. Deal with all these issues. This task force will not be able to do all that. We got a piece of it, but we can't do it all. And when you're talking about grand juries, we don't do grand juries. And so there are so many different moving parts here that it's gonna take a more comprehensive look than we could ever do in 90 days in order to really start getting a handle. And we gotta tap into the talent, the elected officials, researchers, and academics, community folks. I mean, there's so many people that could add value to that discussion. And we need to have it, and we need to have it pretty quick. We made a change in the, in the use of the police department in the 1990s. Uh, we raised the uh, recruitment age to 21, and they were required 60 hours of college. Complaints went way down. Just that extra maturity and that extra exposure and a little bit of education. Yeah, we've got to 60 hours in 20 years of age. So most, a lot of departments have done that. But, you know, again, is that enough by itself? I think we need to but really... I, I don't want to lose the comment, though, because, uh, you know, much of what uh, energized this was actually after the criminal justice system did not perform what people thought was accountability. Now, I don't, ha I don't have enough uh, knowledge or perspective to, to make specific judgments each time, but if you're talking about justice and you use those words and, and, and con contrasted that with uh, policing alone, doesn't the criminal justice system have to be just as much a part of how we think about this and reflect? It, it and does, and I think that's what Commissioner Ramsey was talking about. You need to look, look at this comprehensively, holistically, but you, do we want a system that we, 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 we put our police officers in... Uh, harm's way. We put our police officers in harm's way. We give them literally life and death authority over us we, we, and we trust them uh, to use it well. Uh, it's stacked in favor of the officer when they go in front of a, a, a grand jury because we have granted them that authority. And I, I wanted to ask you why you thought it failed. Because they, so because they didn't indict? No, so I thought it failed for a number of reasons. The first is the system in and of itself, you have a, a, a prosecutor um, who can elect to use an entirely different process for that particular grand jury than he did with, with all the other um, cases that that particular grand jury heard. That prosecutor is someone who works in that community who relies on um, the, the testimony of police officers to be able to affect um, convictions in that particular community. So there's already an inherent bias um, in that relationship. And then um, when you look at um, the way that the evidence was presented to the grand jury, allowing uh, people that you know to not have been uh, a witness to that crime uh, to prevent to present false evidence, which is against the law. In fact, in Missouri, you, you you've that, articulated really well why it's not just about the result, but but the process, and that goes to that that consistency, that that pro a a system where uh, in a case such as this, you use an independent prosecutor. A lot of cities are having that conversation about whether that's the appropriate method. You have to use the same process every time. That's part of the accountability and transparency. Let me get, get in here, because I, I, yes. I, feel, I feel the, the yes. essence of the question, and I want to add a component to it. One of the, the ways that we have a difficulty dealing with racism and injustice today is that they took the darn signs off the water fountains. So now, when it's going on, you don't have the immediate comparison. You don't say, you're getting treated this way because you are black. I rarely hear that from people, occasionally, but that's mostly from my mom, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> so, 
So because you only have the example that's in front of you, you don't have an audit of what the, the alternate is. Yeah. When I go into some police departments and we look at the disciplinary records, right, they have five years of complaints of, of racial profiling or uh, racial discrimination and not one sustained case. I don't know whether or not that could possibly be true, but those numbers look funny to me compared to other de uh, departments where they have very few, but they have, they have some. And none of those records are available for public research. So I hear that. I, uh, when I go into communities, what they say is that the system failed us because there was a sense of injustice, regardless of what happened in that particular case, that resonated with their lived experience, not their perception, their experience of it. But I think the pushback should not be so much on the particular grand jury, the particular police department, or the particular shooting. It should be on the evidence that allows us to be informed consumers on what makes a suspicious amount of exonerations versus the appropriate amount. We don't have information. We don't have an evidence base for pursuing social justice. But there's a lack of trust. I mean, so whatever the and outcome, what? there's a lack of trust. And, and, and there's, it's understandable why people would not trust the system, and we have to restore that uh, somehow. The solution isn't just getting rid of the grand jury process, though. And so we have to be careful about how we go about trying to fix something, yep. uh, because you know, if not that, then what? Now, not every state or jurisdiction has even has a grand jury process, but if not that, then what? Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's it's easy to say that, but we need to really carefully <coughs> think these things through, and not just have a knee-jerk response because of, of of a few cases, and then we wind up with another issue that we've got to deal with. Okay, I'm going to uh, ask for one last short question. I do want to visit Philadelphia in the future uh, and be on good terms with you, Commissioner. <laughs> so I don't want you to, and traffic is a problem here. Okay, thanks for waiting. Um, Carmen Siriani, I teach sociology at Brandeis, and I'm also a fellow at the Ash Center, and in fact have learned a great deal about community policing from some of my colleagues here. Um, I was going to ask a slightly different question, but the Commissioner putting on the table this notion of a national commission seems to beg, like, let's see if we can fill that in more. And, and, and a couple things come to mind to me. One is how important it would be to not have a commission that is just 20 commissioners, an advisory group, meet right. twice in Washington, once in Chicago, go home, write your report, but that is connected to some vital conversations in communities with multiple stakeholders that have real issues with each other so that the nation, which is crying out for some answers, can see what this kind of, where the, what this kind of dialogue and what trust building right. might be like. Um, that that's absolutely critical um, to do some version of that. And secondly, uh, related to that is we have so much good practice in different cities is to also bring forward those people who have been very successful working across right. these boundaries, who have been paragons in the way they've done the training, the way they've done beat meetings and all this stuff, and make sure that's a central part of the conversation, that it's not just this critique, 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 oh, we need some federal laws on, you know, body cameras and all that stuff. I mean, if we don't do that, we're going to miss the opportunity that this raises, I would think. Well, I agree with you 100%. And unlike 1965, we have social media. We're being live streamed right now. We have the capacity to reach everyone, not just in this country, but around the globe. If we don't take advantage of that and use that to our benefit to get input and to create dialogue, then shame on us. I'm not talking about closed-door sessions in Washington or wherever and a handful of folks that are gonna decide whatever. We have a tremendous opportunity to get input like never before because this isn't 1965. This is the 21st century and we have access and we can leverage communication uh, in, in, a, just a, in a way in which it's just unparalleled and that in itself is a springboard for future discussions and not falling out of touch again not letting that discussion and that dialogue die mm -hmm. simply because we think we've resolved an issue. It's got to be continuous. I would just add to the, the, the way you've asked that question is an insistence on procedural justice for an analysis of procedural justice and criminal justice. So very meta of you and congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Last comment, Mayor? All right, well, uh, this has been a terrific conversation and uh, thoughtful, nuanced, but also very much forward-looking. So first, I want to thank you all for being here. 
I also want to thank you for keeping us safe and helping us to think about a better future for us all, not only in policing, but actually in a democracy. Uh, these are huge challenges we face. One quick thing. This discussion you're going to have next week is vitally important. Please participate. Those recommendations will come to the task force. I need to hear from you, okay? And it's like everything else. You know, if you don't participate and become an active partner, then don't sit around and beef about it later. Because you've got an opportunity here. Please take advantage of it. All right. Thank you very much. That was terrific. Thank you so much. You were terrific. So I want to briefly introduce our, our guests, but mostly to focus, get right into discussion. Uh, to my immediate left here is Mayor Anise Parker. Um, she was elected May, uh, Houston's 61st mayor in uh, 2010, one of only two women in the, in the, to hold the city's highest elected, official, uh, elected office and one of the first, uh, uh, one of the very few openly gay mayors of large cities. Uh, she's also chair of the Criminal and Social Justice Committee in the U.S. Conference of Mayors. By all accounts, she's doing a remarkable job. Uh, Re-elected, what, three times now? Um, uh, Two-year term, that's another tough thing for a mayor. Um, in 2010, she was named to the Time 100, among the, meaning the 100 most powerful people uh, in the world. Uh, she spent many years in the service to people of Houston, six years as city councilor, uh, six years as controller, um, she's held the offices of controller, city councilor, and mayor, the first person to do that. Um, she's a member of President Obama's task force on climate preparedness, chairs the conference of mayors, uh, criminal ju social justice committee, as I mentioned, uh, and a variety of other things. She's also, one of the most interesting features is she taught in the police academy for five years prior to becoming uh, mayor. So she's someone that really has crossed these boundaries over and over. And uh, just last December, just a few months ago, um, she was ranked as, as the top U.S. mayor in a worldwide competition for the best mayors and in the top 10, number seven, I believe, uh, worldwide mayor uh, by the, uh, for the World Mayor Prize. So congratulations on that. Um, <laughs> next, we have uh, Commissioner Charles Ramsey, who was appointed uh, Philadelphia Police Commissioner in 2008. Uh, and he leads the fourth largest police department in the nation with 6,400 sworn and 800 civilian uh, members. He co-chairs the president's task force, President Obama's task force on 21st century policing. And he's really very much been in the forefront of innovative police to, uh, policing strategies, evidence-based initiatives, organizational accountability, an important word for tonight, uh, and neighborhood-based programs while leading organizational change in the departments. He's previously served as uh, in the DC, as DC uh, uh, commissioner as well. He currently serves as president of both the uh, Police Executive Research Forum and the major uh, cities police uh, chiefs association. He is the only law enforcement official professional to hold both these uh, positions simultaneously. He too has received numerous awards, among them the John M. Uh, Penrith Leadership Award from the FBI. Major Cities Chief National Executive Institute, um, Leadership in Policing Award from the Police Executive Research Forum, and the Innovations in American Government uh, Award from the Ash Center here at the Harvard Kennedy School. Please join me in welcoming Commissioner Ramsey. <laughs> Third, we have Professor Philip uh, Goff. He's a visiting scholar here at the Malcolm Weiner Center for Social Policy, uh, and he's on the faculty at UCLA. Uh, he's an expert in race, policing, and intersectional identity. In that capacity, he's been recruited uh, as a researcher and a consultant to police departments around the country, a role he plays enthusiastically. Indeed, he's done work with Houston, um, and I think you grew up in Philadelphia, is that right? So lots of connections. Uh, his research investigates the possibility that both contextual explanations pay, that contextual explanations play an uh, underexplored role in producing racial inequity, uh, but rather than focusing on racial attitudes that are internally individual, he often examines ways in which environmental factors can produce racially disparate outcomes. Um, quite strikingly, he's the co-founder with Captain Tracy uh, Cassie of the Center for Policing Equity, which is a research consortium 
that does promote transparency and accountability uh, by facilitating innovative research collaborations between police departments and scholars. So again, it's hard to imagine uh, a better group uh, for us to think this through. So I guess I'd actually like to uh, start in the middle here with the Commissioner and ask you, um, uh, Commissioner Ramsey, uh, these horrible events that we've been seeing and the really uh, the highly visible loss of credibility um, uh, in some communities and police departments, maybe it's never been there, but how do you explain what we've been seeing? Um, how, uh, even as you've been part of the commission and so forth, what have you seen around the country? Uh, help us understand the basic problem here we're facing. Well, I think what you see <coughs> is the result of something that's been simmering beneath the surface for quite some time. Uh, it, it really does boil down to this, uh, believing that it's going to, you know, prevent larger um, offenses from occurring in the future. And there's some, um, uh, certainly in my opinion, <coughs> I believe that there's, um, you know, some, some evidence to show that that can in fact happen. But I think the problem for me is that whereas we had a strategy to go in and deal with these kinds of disorder type crimes that really destroy quality of life in the neighborhood, but we didn't have an effective strategy to deal with once the window was fixed. Once that broken window began to get repaired, you can't keep doing the same thing. And so our inflexibility, if you will, to start making adjustments, to start building community, start community building so that people if you want that window to stay repaired, then the community has to take ownership and they have to make the necessary adjustments in order to be able to maintain whatever gains were made. And we didn't do that across the board. Now when I say that, I'm not talking about policing across the board. Maybe there are some agencies that did. We didn't. I mean, it didn't. I didn't start thinking about it until after this, this began. And it started, you know, what are we really doing? And do we still need to do the same kinds of things that we were doing before? Uh, how do we build that capacity within communities? How do we, you know, in, during the course of ComStat, everybody wanted to be New York. Everybody wanted to have a 90% drop in homicides. And there was a lot of, you know, police chiefs and political leaders and so forth that wanted the same thing, fine. But we started concentrating more on the dots on the map and where it was occurring and what we needed to do than we <coughs> did with the real human interaction and getting to know people, we kind of pulled away from some of the things that have been successful in community policing, building those relationships and working together to solve problems, we became very data driven. But you know, behind every icon on a map is a human being whose life's been changed because of crime and we can't lose sight of that. It's a neighborhood in peril. There's people who are out there suffering. We don't need to add to that. We need to have that human touch and I think we've, we've made some, um, we've stumbled along the way a bit and I think that that's kind of led to where we are today, but it's fixable stuff. Um, Professor Goff, you've been working with police departments. You've been on this issue long before the events. Indeed, you came here to be on leave, and uh, it's been instead a very, um, very potent and productive time, but I'm sure very demanding. This is one of the important life lessons. Don't mix up your pages before you come out. My name is David Elwood, and I want to welcome all of you to this very important uh, and I hope very productive discussion tonight. Uh, I'm the dean here at the Harvard Kennedy School, and the title of tonight's talk is Challenges to Democracy, the Future of Policing. And our focus is very much going to be on solutions, about ideas, about looking to the future. Uh, here at the Kennedy School, we spend a lot of time trying to understand the nature of the problems and the life that we face. But ultimately, our goal is to work across boundaries and to think about ideas and solutions. And we, w we have with us here tonight three truly exceptional people, each of whom has been engaged quite uh, actively and visibly in finding solutions to the kinds of crises and the loss of legitimacy that is so often felt. Uh, among uh, particularly the African American community, but other communities and many of our major police departments. And of course, the tragic events with the uh, killing of Michael Brown and Eric Garner uh, and so many others uh, uh, has been a lightning rod for, for all of us uh, and for many people uh, very, very personal. 
I did want to highlight this is just one of many activities, and those of you who are interested, I hope, are aware that there's also a series of discussions next week called The Week That Shaped the Future of Policing, where uh, uh, folks in the, uh, uh, by the, Ken the Kennedy School and members of student government will bring together a group of people in a, ser in a series of evenings, uh, and the hope is to put together uh, concrete recommendations to pass along to President Obama's commission uh, about policing the 21st century, co-chaired, by the way, by <coughs> one of our guests here. So I also want to thank the uh, Malcolm Wiener Center for Social Policy, um, the Ash Center for Democratic Governance, the Criminal Justice Program, uh, and certainly the Institute of Politics for all the work uh, to put this together. And I especially want to thank our guests, several of whom have flown long distances in order to be here. Um, and it isn't for the weather, I am sure. To the trust and legitimacy, which you mentioned earlier. And uh, certainly the um, Ferguson incident, um, the um, New York City, Cleveland, uh, as well as others, uh, really served as a spark to bring it to the surface. Uh, this is something, I've been in policing for um, a long time. I'm in my 47th year uh, in, in the business. So I've seen these kinds of things um, come and go, but this is a little different. Um, I've not seen the kind of widespread protests that we've had recently. Um, I've not really seen the level of um, concern and even anger on the part of people um, toward police directly, not toward some other event that may be going on, you know, like the Vietnam War, for one example, when I was a young rookie cop and we were kind of in the middle of it. But this is really directed at police. So I see this as a huge challenge, but also a tremendous opportunity for change in our profession. Um, you know, we've been engaged in community policing in general for the last 20 plus years, but clearly there are some communities that we have not reached. And, um, <clears throat> and we need to establish communication. We need to begin the process of, of building trust uh, because it's just not there in many of our communities, unfortunately. It's not everyone, but it's a significant number. And uh, we need to listen and hear what people are saying to us and make the changes necessary in order to gain the kind of respect, the kind of trust, the legitimacy that we need to have in order to be effective in building safe neighborhoods. And um, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, but I'm excited about what's going on now because I think this is a great opportunity to have the kind of change that's really needed. How do you do that? How do you build trust? In the I think it starts with communication. It starts with building relationships people at some point in time have to listen to one another. And I think that's really key. And, um, you know, we need to, to take a real look at ourselves and some of the strategies that perhaps we've used. I, you know, when I hear people uh, talking about, for an example, uh, the broken windows and something that since 1982, when it was written, uh, more and more departments began to engage in the kind of activities that deal with lower level offenses.